expert, former prosecutor, and um, she knows and understands American idealism. Uh, please give a hand for Chris Ann Hall.
I want to do, but I won't because some things are wrong. Because you see, there are only two things that will stop a man from murdering his neighbor. One is the understanding I am free to go next door and murder my neighbor if I want to, but I won't because it's wrong. The other thing is a well-armed neighbor. <laughs> You guys know more than anybody, or should know, criminal laws do not stop crimes. Criminal laws are not designed to stop crimes. Criminal laws are designed to identify criminal activity and establish the mechanism to punish criminals. If criminal laws stopped crimes, we would be a crime-free nation because we got way too many criminal laws. Laws we cannot even enforce, even in our wildest of dreams. Because you see, the only thing that stops someone from committing a crime is saying, I can do that, but I won't, because it's wrong. It's this thing of liberty that we have to understand, because it's the thing that John Adams said, we must support liberty at all hazards. We have a right to it derived from our maker, but if we have not, our fathers have bought and purchased this liberty for us with their ease, their estates, their pleasure, and their blood. Because you see, liberty comes at a price. And that's the second recurring theme that I've been seeing here today. Liberty comes at a price. It's not a matter of will you pay. It's a matter of when will you pay. I didn't volunteer for this. God had a call for me. I didn't accept it readily, but I fear God more than I fear man, and I felt God's boot in my butt, because he spoke to me through Esther. He spoke to me through the parable of the talents, and I may not be a recovering Baptist preacher, but I am a Baptist minister's wife, so you'll have to tolerate me just a little bit. You see, Liberty is a gift from God, but it comes at a price. I was told that I could not teach the Constitution on my spare time and keep my job. I was a prosecutor for the state of Florida told that if I teach the Constitution and I teach limited government, that was an ethical conflict for me. I was told you can, you can speak or you can keep your job. I said, that's my right, not yours. I'm not going to let you take that from me. And my liberty, the liberty that belongs to my son, is more important than a paycheck. You see, it's going to cost you something. That's what started my ministry. And this is a ministry for me. I travel all over the country. I teach the Constitution. I am uh, grateful for what Sheriff Mack has done because Sheriff Mack is spreading the truth of liberty and he's utilizing the tools that we have because we can't all do everything. I can't be everywhere, but I meet, I've met several people today that teach the Constitution. Not maybe what I teach, but the things that are important about the Constitution nonetheless. And because of Sheriff Mack, I spent two days in Northern California teaching the deputies of Del Norte County the importance of their oath and why we support and defend the Constitution. You see, you're not only being given a call to stand for liberty today, because that is what the call is, to stand for liberty, but you have to recognize something. Liberty, John Adams said, was bought and paid for by our fathers. He says, our fathers have bought and purchased this liberty for us. Liberty is not a gift that you purchase for yourself. Liberty is a gift that you pay forward. We enjoy the liberty that has been bought by those who have come before us. It is our job to pay forward our liberty. If we do nothing, we don't suffer. But future generations do. Sam Adams said, if we tamely suffer a lawless attack on liberty, we encourage it. 
Because you see, when we're talking about liberty here, doing nothing is not doing nothing. Doing nothing is actually being a cheerleader on the sidelines, cheering on and empowering tyranny. He said, when we tamely suffer a lawless attack on liberty, we encourage it. And we involve others in our doom. He said it is a very serious consequence to consider as millions yet unborn will be the miserable sharers of our negligence. See, we have a charge not only to stand for liberty, but to preserve the blessings of liberty to our posterity. But always remember this. No matter what you're doing, there are people watching you. And by tamely suffering this lawless attack on liberty, what are you teaching our children? You're teaching our children by everything that you do. So you have to ask yourself, do you want to teach your child to be a patriot? Or do you want to teach your child to be a slave? Because if you allow this liberty to be subverted, to be overrun, to be completely destroyed by the tyrants in our government, then you're a slave yourself and you're teaching your children the same thing. Can I break some news to you? I have a radio show that runs Monday through Friday out of my state capitol. I love being up there because they hate me. <laughs> I went up there and spoke to the Senate committee about nullification. My Senate president, Don Gates, sent me an email because I told him that he needed to stand for the liberty that belonged to his people and as, as a representative of the state of Florida, as a senator of the state of Florida, he had an inherent right to stand against federal encroachment. He sent me an email and told me that I should be shot or hanged. Do you think that's the proper behavior for a Senate president? Where's my Duval County Sheriff? You still here? Just watch out, because I don't know where my sheriff comes, but if Don Gates comes after me to, shot or hang, to shoot or hang me, I'm going to be giving you a call, man. Move to Duval. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen. You have an inherent duty by the nature of who you are, whether you be a law enforcement officer or a citizen, you have a duty to preserve this liberty. And on my radio show, I always tell people I endeavor to bring you the truth. The bad news is the truth is never fair and balanced. The truth is sometimes hard to deal with. I want you to understand some things that you're seeing. The truth of the matter is that this is not a Republican or Democrat thing. You have to understand that your conservative Republican House has handed more power to this president than he stole it on his own. NDAA, the one of the most heinous provisions in 1022 is the Section 4 waiver incorporated by your Republican House because the president said he wouldn't sign it unless you, it was in there. And that thing, you know, not only NDAA not only allows for the indefinite detention, but this is the worst thing, as if that could get worse, right? It allows the president to transfer the powers under the laws of war outside a declaration of war to this thing called hostilities. Why do you care? Because the same Section 4 waiver allows the president to transfer the power under the laws of war from the military to the Department of Homeland Security. You wonder why the TSA, you wonder why DHS is getting 1.6 billion rounds of ammunition because they have been empowered with the power under the laws of war. Thank you, Republican House. Justice Kennedy in his Arizona ruling declared that government agents have more power than the states. That's a big thing that came out of that Arizona immigration ruling by Justice Kennedy is that the individual discretion of individual agents has more power than the states. Justice Scalia, I thought he was the good guy, right? Just issued a ruling on Monday 
that says in its city of Arlington versus the FCC that agencies have the ultimate authority to define their own boundaries and that the court should have nothing to do with that. Do you know what that means? That means if there's a vague issue within the rule, Justice Scalia said, the courts don't need to have anything to do with that. That's up to the agencies themselves. So when you have these things called water in the Clean Water Act of the EPA, that means the EPA is the sole determination of what water means under federal jurisdiction. And you have no challenge now in court. What about HR 347? Thanks to a Republican, HR 347, the Federal Building and Ground Improvement Act has nothing to do with planting trees and making filling potholes, but makes your First Amendment a federal offense if you simply disrupt the orderly conduct of government business. That's the new standard for the First Amendment. So you need to not only be worried about the TSA, but you need to be worried about the DHS and the Secret Service coming into your jurisdiction and trying to arrest your people for disagreeing with their congressman at a town hall meeting. How about SB 1813, which allows the IRS to seize your passport without any due process whatsoever simply because they determined you have a delinquent tax debt. And some even interpret that to allow them to treat you as a convicted felon without any due process and take your guns. What about the Food Safety Modernization Act? Because after all, we have to have the FDA have an armed SWAT team so we can raid Amish farmers for their weapons of mass destruction called raw milk. Do you know why that TSA provision says we're only in the search, we're not in the seizure business? Because they have no authority to arrest in your jurisdiction without your permission. The only way the federal government can effectuate a lawful arrest is with your permission. That's why you have the ultimate authority and right to say, get out. I will not allow this to happen to my citizens. We have a high school boy in Bethune, Massachusetts, who's been arrested for posting a rap about the Boston bombing on Facebook. He is still on jail. He's looking at 20 years in prison because the police department said his rap was particularly violent. When was the last time you heard a rap song on the popular culture that was not particularly violent? My goodness, even in my day, we had cop killer. Are we going to start arresting all of these rap artists now? No, because they have major record labels. We don't arrest them. We give them Grammys. I want to share with you a couple things because I think the overriding theme is this. What can one man do? One man by the name of James Otis Jr., an attorney who had received the highest post any attorney can get in the colonies, basically the attorney general of his, of his post, in charge of arresting and prosecuting people for these writs of assistance, which by the way, we have today, whether you realize that or not. We have modern day writs of assistance. Modus Jr. called them um, the worst instruments of arbitrary power, the most destructive of liberty, and we have them today, thank you Patriot Act. They're called national security letters. We screamed we needed them to protect us from terrorists, and the Government Accountability Office found out that in 2006, 49,000 national security letters were issued, served on al-Qaeda terrorists? No, 60% of them were served on US citizens and legal resident aliens. They need no warrant, they need a handwritten warrant, arbitrary power in the hands of the agents, arresting and seizing people with no Fourth Amendment protection whatsoever. 
where James Otis Jr. fought against these writs of assistance for five hours. John Adams wrote about it later, and he says, Otis was a flame of fire. With a promptitude of classical illusions, a depth of research, a rapid summary of historical events and dates, a profusion of legal authorities and prophetic glare into his eyes of the, into the future, and a rapid torrent of impetuous eloquence, he hurried away all before him. John Adams said, 40 years later, he said, American independence was then and there born. The seeds of patriots and heroes to defend the vigorous youth were then and there sown. Every man of an immense crowded audience appeared to me to go away as I did, ready to take arms against writs of assistance. Then and there was the first scene of the first act of opposition to the arbitrary claims of Great Britain. Then and there, the child of independence was born. And in 15 years, he grew up to manhood and declared himself free. James Otis Jr. lost his profession. He lost everything. Argued for five hours and lost. But you see, you never know who's watching. Because in that gallery was John Adams and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Sam Adams. And they birthed independence that day. How about Crispus Attucks? Anybody know him? Crispus Attucks was the first man to die in our battle for liberty. Crispus Attucks was a black man, a, a slave who had become a free man. He was a whaler for the merchant marines. He heard the bells of alarm go off on his ship. He climbed up, up top to, to find out where the fire was, because that's generally what the alarms meant. Can you imagine being on a wooden ship? Anything worse than a fire only to find there was no fire, but that his own government had brought up arms against him. He ran back in the ship, got 55 other of his shipmates, and came out and died for our liberty. There was this poem written about him. Honor to Crispus Attucks, who was leader in voice that day, the first to defy and the first to die with Maverick, Carr, and Gray. Call it riot or revolution, his hands his hand first clenched at the crown. His feet were the first in perilous place to pull the king's flag down. His breast was the first one rent apart that liberty's stream might flow for our freedom now and forever. His head was first laid low. Call it riot or revolution or mob or crowd as you may. Such deaths have been the seed of nations. Such lives shall be honored for a. What about Ned Hector? Ned Hector was a freed slave who fought in the battles of Brandywine in Germantown. When the order came for his troops to retreat, had Ned Hector refused to retreat. He, he made the statement, he shouted, the enemy shall not have my team, I will save the horses or perish myself. How many of your history books teach that there were battalions of freed slaves that fought for our liberty. The states had provisions that if you were a slave and you wanted to fight for liberty in the Revolutionary War, you would be declared a free man. There are men <coughs> whose only free breath was given so that you and I could be free. And how do we repay them? We completely wipe them out of history to, to appease some insidious progressive agenda to maintain that slavery in this nation today. I'm sorry, but that is the most evil and racist thing that I can think of. What about the women? Because the women sacrificed more than the men did often being left alone for a year or more at a time. Elizabeth Adams, the wife of Sam Adams, wrote Sam a letter one day and said, don't worry about us. If the British should take Prospect Hill, we have escape route. How many of you woke up this morning with an escape route from your own government? 
And in her letter, she doesn't call him a sorry rascal for never coming home or not sending any money. She does nothing but tell him, don't worry. And then she apologizes and says, please excuse my letter. The paper is bad and my pen is made from a broken pair of scissors. Sacrifice. <coughs> it's going to cost you something. How many of you have heard of Penelope Barker? Penelope Barker held the second tea party. After the men in Boston threw tea in the harbor, there were 55 women called together in Edenton, North Carolina. They pledged to not purchase any English-made goods until the laws that enslaved their people had been repealed. And they made this statement. They said, Remember now, Justice Ginsburg and Hillary Clinton and the like want our daughters to believe that the women were weak and irrelevant. So I want you to keep that in mind as we discuss these weak and irrelevant women. They said maybe it has only been the men who have protested the king up to now. That only means we women have taken too long to let our voices be heard. And then they went on to say we are signing our names to a document not hiding ourselves behind costumes like the men in Boston did at their tea party. The British will know who we are. How about that for weak, irrelevant women calling out the men for being a bunch of weenies hiding behind costumes? <laughs> but you know what's even more amazing than that? These are not women of no reputation. These were women whose husbands, fathers, brothers, uncles, were English merchants. <clears throat> they had pledged to not purchase any English-made goods, sending their names and the names of the men who were English merchants to the British government. In that single statement, without saying that words, they declared that liberty was more important than the paycheck that would, would provide them with food and even more dear than the very lives of the men who would provide it. What can one man do? What can one woman do? Sow the seeds of independence. That is our obligation. Winston Churchill said, still if you will not fight for the right, when you can easily win without bloodshed. If you will not fight when your victory will be sure and not too costly, you may have to fight with all the odds against you and only a precarious chance of survival. There may even be a worse case, he said. You may have to fight when there is no hope because it is better to perish than to live as a slave. We have an obligation not to ourselves. I was a Russian linguist in the army. I studied the Russian culture, the communist takeover of Russia, and I can tell you with great sincerity, if we do nothing, we will not suffer the consequences of our negligence. But we will condemn our children and our grandchildren to purchase back a gift that was supposed to be purchased by us and they won't do it at the ballot box. They will not do it when it won't cost much and it won't take much to get it. They will be making the choice to pick up muskets and they will buy back that gift with their blood. You see, this is the decision that we have to make. Is the Constitution worth preserving? That's the question that, that Daniel Webster asked his people in 1806. So let me ask you again, because I maybe think you, you think it was a speech and not a question. Is our Constitution worth preserving? Yes. Yes. Daniel Webster said, then guard it as you would the very seat of your life. He said, guard it not only against the open blows of violence, but against, and he wrote this in 1806. I'm not making this up. Guard it not only against the open blows of violence, but also against the seed of change. He said, miracles do not cluster, and that which has happened but once in 6,000 years may never happen again. One government 
A government such destroyed would leave a void to be filled, perhaps with centuries of riot and tumult, evolution and despotism. You see, I teach the history of our Constitution. It didn't start in 1787. It started in 1041. Our Constitution has a genealogy. It took 700 years to write our Constitution. Five fundamental documents that had to be written, and the first one was not the Magna Carta. The first one was the 1100 Charter of Liberties, and Daniel Webster knew this. He knew that they went from 1100 to 1215 battling for liberty. He knew that they went from 1628 to 1641 battling for liberty. He knew they went from 1641 to 1688 battling for liberty and from 1688 to 1776 to get the greatest documents that we would ever see, the greatest human rights statements ever written by man called the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And I don't care what Justice Ginsburg says about it, she should be impeached. But you see, if she was following along, if you were following along, you noticed I missed a big chunk of time there. Because Daniel Webster also knew that they had to fight from 1215 to 1628. 400 years. Go ahead and put the picture up. I want you to see, and I forgot to play the video, so we'll just. No, we'll do the picture now. We'll do the video at the end. This is why I do what I do. This is my ministry. It is a ministry. I don't charge anything for anything that I do. If you want me to come teach your deputies for a week, there's never any speaking fee. I don't even require you to pay for my travel. This is a ministry because God called me to it, and I believe where God calls, he will provide. And we have been doing this for three years, and we have never begged for bread. But you see, every morning I look up at that face, and I wonder, what have I done to preserve his liberty? Because every day now, that's the question that's going to have to come to your mind. As you run to, through young people in your lives and you lock eyes with them, you have to ask yourself, what have I done today to preserve their liberty? Because if you do not, you will condemn them to buy back a gift that was supposed to be purchased by you with their blood. <clears throat> Amy Carmichael. A great missionary in India in 1892 tells of a dream that she had. She had this dream where she was standing on the edge of a cliff watching people run off this cliff to a hellish abyss, she said. And in that, there were people lined up along that cliff, arm in arm, trying to prevent people from diving off the edge of that cliff into a hellish abyss. And then she noticed in her dream that there were a group of people, a large group of people, just sitting under a shade tree. She said the very picture of peace, making daisy chains. Every once in a while, she said in her dream, somebody would try to get up from making the daisy chains and go help prevent people from leaping to their death. And they would get pulled down by the others and say, what are you so worried about? Are you sure it's the time to go help? Why are we so concerned about all this? What are you really going to do anyway? Look at all those people. How are you going to stop all those people from leaping to their death? And the people would sit back down and get to making their daisy chains. Amy Carmichael says in her dream, she ran over to them and started screaming. What are you doing? Get up! Get up! We must fill the gaps. You must stand in the gap. Get up. Why are you still sitting here? She wrote this poem. 
Onward Christian soldiers, sitting on their mats, nice and warm and cozy like little pussy cats. Onward Christian soldiers, how brave we are. Don't we fight our battles very comfortably? What can one man do? One man can sow the seed of independence. One woman can strengthen a generation. One man, one woman can stand in the gap. All I'm asking is will you stand in the gap? Because I don't want to look at the end and watch that one leap over the edge because he didn't know any better and because nobody was there to stop him. That is your call when you take the oath to support and defend the Constitution, to protect and serve, your call is to stand in the gap. Will you stand? Will you stand? <clears throat> For those who came before us and gave the ultimate price. For those who live today and cannot. For those who will come in the future, we have an obligation to stand in the gap.
Thank you.